Hi class, I'm Dr. Shantz and welcome to our research methods chapter, chapter 6, for non-experimental research. In this chapter we look at uh, the approach called, the set of approaches called non-experimental and when, what is non-experimental research and when is it best uh, used or when is it most appropriate according to the research questions that someone is asking. We'll look at types of non-experimental approaches that they highlight in the chapter, like what they are, when to use them, how to use them, and some frequently asked questions that have come up in this chapter before. What is non-experimental research? Well, recall in our prior chapter that experimental research was appropriate when the researcher has a specific research question or hypothesis about a causal relationship between two variables and that it's possible, feasible, and ethical to manipulate the independent variable and control the extraneous variables by either randomly assigning participants to conditions in the between subjects uh, experiments or randomly order the sequences of the conditions when we're looking at the within subjects experiments. So that was before. Non-experimental research is used when the question is not about a causal relationship or the study cannot meet the requirements of a true experimental design. And that happens often. Sometimes it's just not feasible or ethical to manipulate the IV. So the type of non-experimental designs are used when research question is about presently occurring thoughts, feelings, or actions. So it evaluates those naturally occurring phenomena and it's used often to describe a variable or a relationship that's pre-existing. In other words, we could not manipulate that condition. It's also used to predict the occurrence of a future variable based on the values of a current variable. You'll see that often in uh, high school GPA. Does that predict college success? So, in other words, there are times when a researcher's question is more about describing what is happening already instead of trying to explain why a behavior happens. And these types of research questions are when a non-experimental approach might be the better, the better path. In our chapter, we consider what and when each of these non-experimental designs might be used. The cross-sectional, correlational, qualitative, and observational approaches. Cross-sectional. It's like taking a cross-section of a building or structure where you get to look at the details of one place in that building. Well, a cross-sectional design looking at people is looking at the attitudes, behaviors, thoughts of the population or sample at one point in time. Different than experimental designs, there's no comparison group at all. In other words, any groups are already pre-existing. These would be things like gender, ethnicity, beliefs or values. In other words, the outcome differences are based on which group someone is already a part of. And we can't set that as a researcher. We can't decide what someone's gender is going to be for the experiment. Um, cross-sectional can also be extended into multiple time points and that would be more of a longitudinal design. That would be like taking a cross-section at say three months and six months and nine months and 12 months. It's still not looking at a process but it's getting those snapshots over time and that's what a longitudinal design would be like. So an example of what this cross-sectional might look like, let's look at uh, Professor Bob's study, right? If he were to ask students about their plans after graduation and give them two options, 
are they planning to go to grad school or are they planning to go to an applied or work position? Those two groups, going to grad school or going to an applied position, are already determined by the participant. The researcher can't manipulate that because that's the intentions and the values of those participants, right? So then you would have these two groups that are already pre-existing. You could not like randomly assign them. So a question that Professor Bob could ask to test, are there differences in students' perceptions of research methods topics between the group of students who plan to go on to grad school and the group of students who plan to acquire an applied position? And that would be a typical research question that would work with this type of cross-sectional approach. Let's look at correlational research. This describes a relationship between two variables. And the catch here is that the variables have to be continuous. So back to our measurement chapter, continuous scale is going to be like your interval scale, like a Likert um, scale across like from disagree to strongly agree. Or it could also be a ratio scale like age or attitudes that are on a scale of one to whatever, as long as more means more of that attribute, then it would be considered a continuous variable. So the correlational research looks at the relationship between two continuous variables. And again, because these variables are pre-existing, uh, there's no way to determine if one of them is influencing the other. It's still just we did not um, condition, we did not randomly assign who was going to be what age or who was going to have a certain level of extroversion, things like that. So again, these non-experimental approaches are looking at how things are without manipulating them. For example, uh, data are evaluated visually and with correlation tests because they're collected about the, the participants as they are. And we look at them visually in scatter plots, uh, and that would be your correlation coefficient, where you have the values on the x and the values on the y, and you see if there's a trend upward or downward. Um, and that can also be tested with the Pearson's correlation coefficient, or Pearson's R test. And then it, get, it can get more complicated, which we'll work with next week in our data week. Uh, the correlation matrix looks at the Pearson's R between more than two variables, like looking at all, all the bivariate, all the pairwise relationships. And work, we'll work on that in our homework correlations assignment. But here's an example. Let's say we collected data on someone's social network. In other words, how many friends a person has, which would be continuous, anywhere from zero friends to 100 friends, or however many it is, right? And we also gather uh, the person's salary. So again, a continuous variable. If both are high at the same time, like lots of friends is correlated with high salaries, it would mean that it has a positive correlation but still, we don't know which, if there's a direction of influence there. We don't know that if uh, lots of friends causes higher salary, or if a higher salary means you have more friends, like brings on more friends. So again, we're not talking about a causal relationship. We're saying that they happen to be high at the same time, or they happen to be opposite. That would be a negative relationship at the same time. Those who have high um, narcissism scores have low uh, counts of friends, something like that. And then correlation is also the foundation of other more complex uh, statistical techniques, such as um, multiple correlation, multiple regression, and uh, factor analysis. And these we're not going to actually use in RM1, but it's something you would do more in 
like grad stats, graduate level stats. A couple of example questions that maybe Professor Bob could use here would be, what is the relationship between conscientiousness, which is a personality trait, and perceptions of research methods? So both of those are measured on a continuous scale, and he could look at what is the correlation between those two, conscientiousness and perceptions of research methods. He could also look at uh, cognitive ability, which is on a continuous scale and see if students with a higher cognitive ability also have higher perceptions of research methods topics. So, like I said, we will work more with correlations in our data week. And until then, just check out the guidance and videos for both installing JASP and getting acclimated to working with data. Uh, that's what we'll be working in with our data week module. Next, we're going to consider qualitative research. And qualitative research refers to studies which focus on understanding the experience of participants. So it's not on a scale, it's not numerical, it's very rich. Like the strengths of qualitative research is the rich detail of participant experiences in their specific group or situation. And it can also generate new research questions and ideas based on the experiences of the participants who are sharing their experiences, right? So the data are collected uh, using either notes from audio and video or interviews or focus groups, but very open-ended questions to gather the full um, scope of that participant's experience with whatever the question's about. Uh, studies using qualitative approaches usually have a smaller sample size because it takes a long time to gather this audio video data or interview data or focus group data because you have to coordinate with a lot of people to be able to get that rich data. And data are processed by deriving themes out of the content of those interviews and the collected responses and also the notes. Data are processed by, again, identifying those themes, identifying sentiment, like that means the person, you could tell the person was happy or sad or excited, like you're deriving feelings and the intensity of feelings out of those responses and developing a base of content from the responses. And we're going to play around with this in a little example later on in the presentation. Um, some examples uh, related to Professor Bob's research, um, some example of research questions that would use a qualitative approach would be something like, what do students think about research methods topics? Just open-ended, no luckered scale, no choose one or the other, right? Just open-ended conversation with the students on what they think about research methods topics. Or what is the experience of research methods students as they work through course topics? Like having a little interview or focus group with students after each assignment and just gathering that information about their experience with that assignment would be one, one qualitative type approach there. And you notice there's no numbers here. But we'll go into that more later as well about quantifying qualitative data. <laughs> and the last approach that they discuss in the book is observational research. And I feel like our text has lumped together several approaches here that in some way or another rely on that systematic observation of participant behaviors. Um, in its most basic form, you can think of like ethnographic type studies, like of cultures or children or other easily observable behaviors. Those would fall into this observational approach. Now essential to this approach is the systematic note-taking of all behaviors or specific behaviors, like if it's a structured observation, 
so that those complete descriptions are available when research go to summarize their findings. So our subcategories within observational include naturalistic, participant observation, either with a researcher disguised or, or undisguised known to the participants, a structured observation approach. Also uh, lumped into here are case studies and archival research. Now archival research, I think the book added this one in because they were really unsure of where else to put it. Because it really depends on what archival data are being reviewed, right? Are we talking about videos? Like you're reviewing videos, like pre-recorded videos, and that's why it's archival. And uh, taking notes on the behaviors that you see in the video of the participants, that would be very observational, right? But a collection of artifacts, like past emails from participants, I guess that would also be a systematic uh, record of their behaviors. That email is a behavior. But like now it's reaching, right? Or survey data, survey data that's already been collected. Like there's some huge data sets from National Center for Education Statistics or the Census Bureau. There's huge data sets that have already been collected, which would be archival. And would that be considered systematically observing behaviors? I'm unsure. So I feel like archival research kind of depends on the type of data in that archival, in that archive, right, as to what's going on. So all of these types of data and all of these types of observational subcategories are useful. It just depends on the research question. So here's frequently asked questions that I get, like, what is the difference between quantitative and qualitative? And which one's better? And it comes down to really, I feel like it helps to see that they're different in terms of the type of data that are being collected. Quantitative data is like immediately numerical, like age or a survey that's already on a Likert scale. That's very quantitative data there. Qualitative data starts out being that very rich type of data, um, like open responses and open conversations, even a structured conversation. If it's not immediately numerical, it's more qualitative in, in its form, right? But a lot of times we take data and we quantify it. Uh, you'll see when we start working with our data set that we could have like groups, like let's say college year. One is freshman, two is sophomore, three is junior, four is senior. So it was more qualitative in nature, like a category, but we're quantifying it so that we can use it in analyses. So they do blend a little bit. But another way that they are very different is in terms of uh, reliability and validity. And again, reliability, think consistent. How is this study and these measures consistent? Validity, how are, how are the things we're being measured true? How are they accurate? So looking at those two, they take a different, um, it's a different context when you're looking at qualitative data compared to qua quantitative data. So let's take just each of these. Internal validity, that's back to how well does this, is the study set up to handle potential extraneous factors, something that might give an alternative explanation to the findings that was not really part of the study. So internal validity, controlling those extraneous variables. External validity is, are the findings that I'm getting here in the study applicable outside of the study? Are they externally still true? Okay. With reliability, we talked about pre and post. Uh, when we test something at the beginning and we test it at the end and it's supposed to be stable, 
then they should be the same. They should be consistent if the attribute that's being measured is supposed to be stable. If it's supposed to be changing, that doesn't work. And then internal reliability, we're going to get more to that when we get into our survey research chapter, is where if we have multiple items all assessing one content domain, then they should be consistent together. They should kind of hang together well. If that content validity, if all those items are supposed to hang very well, then they should be consistent with each other. And then different ways we try to reduce bias, like paying attention to if we are, uh, if the researcher is accidentally um, projecting what they want, right? Um, kind of putting some bias into their expectation. Or the study itself is um, in a way projecting what the research question is about. Or if we're accidentally priming, hey, you had a good day, right? Maybe we don't want to say that, right? And the quality of the question. Again, that's going to come up more in our survey research chapter. The quality of the question items needs to be high. And there we can look at question quality uh, using a, a metric, using a way of assessing the quality of questions. Again, the chapter on survey. Qualitative kind of takes a different look at this. And again, validity, is it true? Is it accurate? Reliability, is it consistent? Right? So let's look at this. If we're looking at, is it true internally? Is the study itself have the quality of really looking at what is being measured? So let's think about a qualitative design of asking, let's say we're asking students about their experience as a freshman. Just really open your experience being a freshman. And if we use different approaches, that's what that triangulation is. If we have focus groups, but we also have interviews, but we also come at it a different way, like maybe um, taking videos of a freshman orientation session, uh, things like this. If we come at it from different angles, then uh, the researcher is more confident that they're actually getting at the concept of interest. So that's that valid. Is it accurately targeting what they're after? Here, remember external validity was, is it applicable outside of this study? And the way that we would say that parallels in the qualitative research, is it transferable? Is it applicable outside of just this one group that I'm observing, right? So external validity, or is it applicable outside? Reliability, is it consistent? And that's gonna lean into how the researcher of a qualitative study has to take very detailed notes very like it has it's very specific how the notes are taken so that they're dependable they're complete and you're able to go back and discern what was being seen just from the notes and you can have different people observing and that's where that inter-rater reliability comes in that if you have different people watching the same situation and they're all looking for the same behaviors to crop up they should be kind of consistent to each other, right? Again, reliability is consistency. And then bias reduction here is that depending on who the observer is and how much they know of the situation, they need to stay objective, right? They need to make sure they're not projecting, looking for something specific. An example, if you had observers watching a playground full of kids and looking for bullying behaviors. But they already have a bias based on gender roles. They might be letting that seep in. And when boys get bullyish, not noticing it, but girls get bullyish and they notice it because it's not in line with what they're expecting. That's what they mean by observer objectivity, that the 
the observer, the researcher doing the observing, has to be super mindful of exactly what behaviors they're looking for and make sure they're not falling into a bias of only seeing what they expect to see, right? And then participant reactivity. Participants being watched kind of get a little like, hey, what's going on here, right? Like the Hawthorne effect, or like whenever uh, you know that your phone calls are being recorded, things like that, you change your behavior, which could impact uh, that study, right? Um, along with this, I put some a video link in the Canvas area that talks about the differences between quantitative and qualitative that you might want to take a look at. So, what I would like to do here is walk you through a qualitative coding example. This isn't part of a homework or anything. It's actually part of an exercise that I do in class, but that's a little hard to do in a virtual environment. So I want to show you this qualitative coding example. In Canvas, in your modules, and down to page six, I placed some items for you uh, to check out in the resources tab. Namely, I uh, wanted to show you this qualitative coding exercise, but you also have a link to the homework qual code which is the actual homework using this, these skills, these qualitative coding skills. And I have a couple of videos here for what is iterator reliability and qualitative versus quantitative methods. But when you download this coding exercise, you'll get to this here. And again, this is something that I use as an in-class exercise for the face-to-face -face courses, um, but it's something that I wanted to show you for how qualitative coding both, um, it's just an approach where we draw out themes, but also looking at how you quantify results as well. So going from a qualitative data collect to a quantified um, element in the data set that you can then use for statistical analyses. So here in this exercise, uh, what I have here are responses, open responses, to uh, the question, how has work-based stress affected you? And the participants in this study were all nursing professionals, and this was pre-COVID, so this was before even COVID was a stressor. And what you think about and when we're looking at the two ways that uh, we work with qualitative data, one is thematic coding. And that's where the researcher is just drawing main themes out of what the response says. So it's just open, open source there. And what themes do you draw out of that response? So let's take a look at the first one here. It's the longest one, that's why we do it together here. Um, we have, this is a response from one of the nurse participants. She says, when I was working, it was rarely a struggle for me to balance my work and private life. Since I was single and living away from my family, I think that overall I was able to set limits so that work-based stress was not a constant factor influencing my life. It was episodic. I had the flexibility and the opportunities to make changes when I thought it was time to do so. The time it influenced me the most was at the end of my career when I was caring for my aging parents. I needed the benefits the agency where I work offered. I was very unhappy with the job and frequently thought of leaving. When my parents passed away, I left the job and went to the nonprofit clinic where I had no benefits. And after my COBRA expired, COBRA is an extension of health care benefits that would have been with the prior job, but now it's like an extension, but it's got a deadline. It might be like 90 days. So when the COBRA expired, I took a second job teaching, which offered the health insurance. There was a lot of work-based stress during this time. 
I enjoyed what I was doing in both jobs. I gave up a lot of my free time for both positions. For a while, I did per diem work at the clinic. And as I, as I started to build a life away from work, I found myself not liking nursing. My license is due to expire in 2020, and I'm ambivalent as to whether I will or not I will renew it. So what you can look for, or what a researcher looks for in themes, is what was being said there overall. Um, it seems like work-family balance was an issue. Benefits might have been an issue. So benefits. Um, we're seeing elder care being an issue. Um, dis, they're discontented now that they've started building a life away from work. So you see how I'm just pulling the things that I notice? That's what we're talking about. And that's one reason that um, you'll see some debate between qualitative and quantitative researchers, right? When they're really set in their fields, uh, a quantitative researcher is like, yeah, because you could have seen anything in there. That's very, very subjective, looking and seeing, oh, what do I think, right? But notice how this is way more rich. This has way more information than, hey, on a, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your job, right? Now that's a solid, no bias kind of uh, response option, but it lacks like color. It lacks the depth of information. So again, it depends on the question being asked. So let me roll up to the other way. Quantifying responses. So if you looked through all of these, like there's a lot, that's number one, but the rest of them are shorter. But there's 24 cases there, 24 responses. Each of them are a different nurse participant in this study. And you could have raters quantifying the responses, but then they would need criteria. They would need to know, what am I looking for? So here's the criteria. On a 1 to 10 scale, how well did the respondent stay targeted to the question? And remember, the question was, how has work-based stress affected you? So on a one, didn't answer the question at all. Five, somewhat answered with, with a lot of tangential information. Or 10, on the mark. And putting like two or five or seven or eight, you didn't have to stay on one, five, and 10, right? And then the raters, like let's say I had groups of three that would rate individually how well they think this respondent stayed on target. And maybe I think it was a five, but it might be one of the other raters in my group thought it was a one or thought it was an eight. And you see now it's the raters are coming from different perspectives. Maybe someone has different experiences in their past and has a family member who's a nurse, things like that, and pulls different things where they feel that this was very much more related to the question or not. So you have some variability there in how the raters quantify how well that respondent stayed on target. So the process ends up being that the raters first individually identify both themes and quantify how well participants stayed on topic. And then after they've done all their individual work, they get together and share, okay, where are they different? And why are they different? If one raider saw specific themes that another raider didn't see at all, they need to talk that through and find out how are they pulling that to find out if it's bias related, like subjectively in, in um, kind of pulled. Uh, well, I used to be a nurse and that's why I saw this. Well, that might not be what the item is actually saying. So the raters help hold each other accountable and they come to a consistent consensus or an agreement on what's really going on with that case. 
they also update their scoring criteria or update on their like directions what they should be looking for. So they might kind of get on the same page with this first 24 cases and then they have another 200 cases to code. But they want to make sure that everyone is on um, a similar understanding of what you're looking for before they go and code the rest of the data. So that's how a qualitative uh, design might work, both in identifying themes and quantifying for something specific in a qualitative data set. Okay. Well, thank you for spending time with me in Chapter 6 on non-experimental. Some takeaways. Non-experimental cannot identify causal relationships, but they are approaches that are used when the research question is appropriate to non-experimental approaches and when we're not looking for a causal relationship. The approaches include cross-sectional, correlational, qualitative, and observational methods. And each method comes with different ways to collect data and analyze it using specific statistical techniques. Which one we use depends on the research question.